Thank you, Manon, and thank you, Dr. Gao. Uh, so next, uh, it's my great honor to introduce my co-chair, uh, Professor Linda Kravinsky uh, from King's College London. Uh, Linda is also an IC fellow and an ISB board member. Uh, he, she is also the secretary of uh, uh, ISV at this moment, and she's a co-chair uh, uh, with me and uh, Margaret Liu uh, co-organized this conference. So, uh, Linda, please, uh, next session. Great, thank you, Sean. So, in this session, we have presentations from pharma approaches towards a COVID-19 vaccine. So the first presentation in this session will be from Janssen, which is based on a replicated viral uh, vector based on the human AD26 serotype that has shown promise as a vaccine platform against Zika, RSV and Ebola. And then the second presentation in this session is the vaccine Pfizer and its partner BioNTech, who have successfully clinical trials, the mRNA lipid nanoparticle technology in the uncold and now applied it to COVID-19. So let's move on for, to um, our first speaker session. And it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce our speaker, Professor Hanneke Scheutmaker. So Hanneke is the global head of vaccine discovery translational medicine for viral vaccines at Janssen, which is part of the Johnson & Johnson Pharma Company. So Hanneke is a virologist who gained her doctoral training in HIV at the University of Amsterdam. And then over the subsequent 20 years, both at the Dutch National Blood Transfusion Centre and also at the University of Amsterdam, where she rose to become chair, departmental chair in experimental immunology. She made major contributions to our understanding of HIV pathogenesis, identifying how the virus adapts to resist neutralization and defining correlates of resistance. Since 2010, she's moved to Janssen, where she's been responsible for Janssen's viral vaccine program, including development of candidate vaccines for HIV, RSV, Zika, Ebola and HPV using the AD26 platform. She's successfully taken several of these candidates all the way through to phase three clinical trials and has just received European regulatory approval for the AD26 vectored Ebola vaccine. So congratulations on that milestone, Hanukkah. So since February, though, her attention is focused on SARS-CoV-2 and she's going to talk to us uh, this afternoon on Janssen's COVID-19 vaccine programme. So it's over to you, Hanukkah. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you, uh, Linda. Thank you very much for this very kind uh, introduction. And it's uh, good to see you again, although it's uh, not live this time. Uh, so, and thank you for the opportunity to give you an update on the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine program that we are running in Janssen. And, and uh, uh, well, I, I will give you sort of where we are uh, at this point. So in the next slide, um, this is the timeline that we followed in relation to the happenings in the world uh, in relation to this uh, uh, outbreak of, of SARS-CoV-2 uh, and, and, and COVID-19. So in, in, as everybody knows, the end of last year, the first uh, reporting of, of cases of pneumonia in Wuhan uh, came, uh, were, were made public and uh, mid-January already the uh, sequence of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, was made uh, available based on which many developers uh, started to work on uh, on a vaccine and, and that also included uh, us. Uh, following the announcements uh, by WHO of a public health emergency of international concern and subsequently the uh, declaration of a pandemic, uh, we were um, gearing up our activities, uh, uh, so first uh, designing uh, uh, the, the S-protein uh, um, uh, vaccine candidates uh, to, to, to uh, sort out what would give best immunity and best manufacturability. And uh, end of March, we selected uh, a lead candidate and are now targeting the start of the first in human study uh, still this month, so uh, we we are getting close, and it is going to happen. Uh, and hopefully, as as was also indicated by Larry Corey, we will have convincing uh, phase one data already uh, in September to initiate uh, a phase three study uh, based upon that to to target uh, uh, um, an application for emergency use authorization uh, by the beginning of next year. 
So in the next slide, uh, this is uh, sort of how uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson is approaching it. So as, as Linda said, Janssen is the pharma company of Johnson & Johnson. And uh, our CEO, Alex Gorski, uh, already committed that we would approach this vaccine development as uh, with, with full dedication, allowing full speed and uh, providing all resources required. We are building our vaccine on, on the platform technology that we have, and I will elaborate uh, on that later in, in the presentation. But this will allow us to uh, facilitate scale up and to, to really uh, have uh, doses available with, with high speed. And finally, the, the, an important pillar that we recognize is the collaborations that we have, as this allows us to rapidly advance uh, our vaccine development based on the best science. So to, to give a little bit of that uh, in more detail, on the next slide, the uh, collaborations are listed. So already early on, we uh, uh, reached agreement with uh, BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, uh, on our uh, platform technology and how to apply it for a COVID-19 vaccine. We uh, engaged with a, a, a long-term partner, uh, Dan Baruch, at the Beth Israel Deacons Medical Center. We set up several additional collaborations uh, to, to facilitate vaccine development, for instance, with the Riga Institute in, in Leuven. We set uh, an agreement with Emergent Biosolutions and Cataland to support our uh, manufacturing ambitions, and we are uh, still discussing uh, additional expansions. And finally, we are working with governments, academia and health authority and many others to speed up uh, the, the, the advancement of, of our vaccine. And, and I, I really think that all of these play a, a major role and it's not just the company, but it's really based on these uh, excellent collaborations and, and con continuous support uh, in, in whatever form, a rapid review and, and in-depth discussions that, that we hope that we will be able to deliver uh, an uh, efficacious vaccine candidate in the end. So on the next slide, there's a, a more in-depth uh, explanation of our platform. Uh, so we call it ADVAC and PERSI-6. So ADVAC is uh, in fact the uh, replication incompetent adeno-26 uh, vector that can express uh, uh, a target antigen of choice. In, in this case, uh, it will be the S uh, protein of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. Um, we know from our platform that it can induce robust and durable immune responses, uh, both uh, humoral and cellular, and uh, next to uh, strong neutralizing activity that we have seen across our programs. We also know that uh, based on this platform, the antibodies can have unique uh, functional features such as ADCC, ADCP, ADCD, etc. So it's not only neutralization but also FC mediated functions that seem to contribute to the, in this case, antiviral uh, activity. We also see good cellular immune responses across programs uh, and uh, these uh, always have a TH1 signature and especially in our RSV program we were uh, able to establish that uh, the, the immune responses that we elicit uh, are not uh, uh, increasing risk for vaccine-associated disease enhancement. And we also rely on, on that as a sort of de-risking signature for our uh, COVID-19 vaccine. The platform has been in uh, over 67,000 subjects uh, to date. And we know across programs that it's uh, safe and well tolerated. Um, and uh, and uh, we, of course, are building on, on that uh, huge database that we already have also for this program. The at 26 vector is uh, replication incompetent because of the deletion of uh, uh, the E1 gene. And as such, we need a helper cell line to, to grow these uh, uh, vectors uh, for vaccine doses. And that for that, we use the PERSI6 cell line that is uh, complementing. It's a human immortalized cell line, which can be grown at very high cell densities in, in absence of serum. And uh, as such, we uh, can get high yields of so number of vaccine doses on a relatively small footprint. Uh, and that obviously coincides with uh, lower CAPEX and lower COX than uh, uh, traditional uh, manufacturing platforms uh, would require. We have uh, good formulation know-how and that uh, has also resulted in a competitive thermostability profile and we strive for availability of vaccine at 2 to 8 degrees for 
uh, a significant period of time, which of course would facilitate uptake and would be compatible with uh, with the cold chain. Uh, as, as Linda already mentioned, we uh, do now have approval for our first at 26 based vaccine. It's in uh, it's our Ebola vaccine, which in combination with an MVA uh, as a second uh, vaccine uh, has now uh, uh, re re received approval and both uh, the at 26 component is produced on the Percy 6 cell line. And before that, there was already a product on the market uh, that is based on Percy 6. This is from one of our licensees, uh, Faring, and this is a recombinant uh, follicle stimulating uh, hormone. So, so there is increasing experience with, with this platform and that hopefully uh, will also uh, help us to for, with a smooth path uh, in, in our interactions with regulatory authorities for this uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine. So on the next slide is the experience that we have with our vaccine platform in, in the Zika field. And just to, to give you a little bit of, of human uh, data. So in this program, we, we used uh, the at 26 uh, expressing uh, the, the Zika antigen. Uh, and uh, we either gave uh, one dose or two doses. And uh, we gave uh, a 5E10 or a 1E11 dose. And you can see that the dose level for the first dose did not uh, really uh, uh, influence the, the immune response after uh, vaccination. So this is uh, the readout here is neutralizing antibody titers. So you can see that the kinetics uh, of the high dose and the low dose group is quite similar. Uh, and we do uh, manage uh, to get uh, a nice increase of the responses after the second dose. So you can see the, the dark uh, green and dark blue, uh, which is again in high dose and low dose. Uh, you can see the increases in the uh, neutralizing antibody titers as compared to the groups that did not receive uh, a second dose. But this is uh, um, sort of uh, re representative data that we see across our program and also that we have uh, 100 percent uh, responder rate. Uh, uh, already in the 90% of the first dose and, and, and up to 100% after the, the second dose. So, so um, yeah, the, the, the platform uh, gives uh, good uh, immune responses uh, uh, across programs. So in the next slide, uh, this is how we uh, approach the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. So uh, similar to uh, many of the other uh, manufacturers, we choose the uh, full S protein as an uh, as an immunogen, uh, because we know from uh, from literature that this is the that this protein is immunogenic and a major target for neutralizing antibodies. Uh, from the SARS-1 experience, we know that uh, uh, that it induces neutralizing antibodies that can target the spike protein and can protect animals from lethal challenge. And um, uh, also, in, in as I already mentioned, in current field, several. Uh, S proteins are in development and we uh, also made several designs and, and found that it was uh, immunogenic. So in the next slide, um, a sort of uh, more detailed explanation of how we approached it. So we uh, um, used the DNA that is encoding for the S protein and cloned that into the at 26 vector to get uh, different vectors that express uh, uh, the S protein with different immunogens. And then we select uh, the, 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 the candidate that has the best immunogenicity and best manufacturability. Um, and, um, but before that, we always uh, also test uh, the DNA for immunogenicity to get a first hint of uh, what to use in, in our uh, um, in our lead candidates. So in the in the next slide. Um, so before. Oh, OK, so this is the yeah. OK, um, I, I had changed the order, but it doesn't matter. So so this is the data that we got out of the uh, DNA immunizations uh, with uh, the different uh, S designs. Um, so we had uh, and compared that to, to sham controls for immunogenicity. So this is just a sort of a candidate screening, not yet the at 26 context, but two times DNA to see what the immunogenicity of the different designs is. So we had several designs, full length S, uh, S uh, without the cytoplasmic uh, tail, without the transmembrane region, uh, only the S1 domain, only the 
receptor binding uh, 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 domain and um, the one with a, a soluble S uh, with stabilizing mutations. And, and in fact, we have a similar construct to what uh, Greg Glenn presented uh, that Novavax is working on. So you can see we have immunogenicity across the different designs, uh, maybe somewhat better for the uh, full length uh, or for the membrane bound uh, S proteins, as you can see the first two. And uh, indeed, if we uh, select uh, uh, or, or if we uh, plot the immunogenicity of the different constructs, you can see on the right part that we have uh, good uh, neutralizing antibody titers in a, in a pseudovirus assay. Uh, but if we only look at the, the monkeys that received either full length S or the membrane bound S with the uh, uh, cytoplasmic tail deletion, that immunogenicity is, is, is better. And compared to convalescent non-human primate sera and, uh, non -convalesc and convalescent uh, human sera, uh, you can see that the immune response listed by these constructs is, is uh, somewhat higher, but uh, it, it, at least it's, it's very immunogenic. So in the next slide, um, we compared uh, the, or we challenged uh, the animals and uh, we uh, then looked for the protective level uh, established by uh, uh, these different constructs. This is uh, all published uh, data uh, and you can see that as compared to the viral load in the Shem controls, uh, which is uh, given here as subgenomic RNA. So this is newly synthesized uh, uh, RNA. We see that indeed the two uh, uh, groups of animals that receive the full length transmembrane bound uh, spike protein, that they seem to be uh, uh, relatively well protected in the lung. Uh, there was uh, less protection for the animals that received uh, a part of the S protein or a soluble S protein. And when we then uh, did uh, the correlation analysis for uh, neutralizing antibodies versus uh, the uh, uh, viral load in the uh, bronco uh, we compared or we did this correlation analysis both for the VNA that was measured in the pseudovirus RNA, uh, pseudovirus neutralizing antibody assay and in the wild type uh, uh, neutralizing uh, antibody or the neutralizing antibody assay uh, where we used wild type virus, you can see there is a nice uh, correlation uh, with viral load. So from this, we uh, concluded that uh, neutralizing antibody titers uh, are uh, likely a correlate uh, of protection, at least to reduce a viral load in Brongo alveolar lavage. So in the next slide, the uh, um, uh, confirmation uh, of, of uh, the, the titer that gives protection. So this was the setup of the non-human primate model where uh, non-human primates were uh, that were not vaccinated were uh, uh, challenged with uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 in different doses. And, and you can see in the different groups that there was a take of, uh, of virus uh, across uh, uh, for the different doses and, and, and in all animals. Um, and interestingly, uh, these animals, of course, developed uh, an, a neutralizing antibody response that was uh, around the titer of one in 100. And when these animals were re-challenged uh, with virus, uh, they uh, turned out to be protected. So this also uh, sort of uh, allows the conclusion that uh, a VNA titer of one in 100 contributes to, uh, to protection we challenge. Uh, of course, in these animals, we, uh, there may be other uh, immune mechanisms that we did not yet take into account, but it, it sort of confirms uh, that, that uh, the, the immune response elicited by um, exposure to virus does uh, elicit protective immunity in these uh, animals. So on the next slide, um, sort of uh, an overview of what we are now doing uh, on our path to the first in human uh, studies that, as I said, will we'll start very soon. So we have selected uh, a final candidate uh, and uh, have uh, done a lot of comparative preclinical testing for immunogenicity and protective efficacy in uh, in mice, hamsters, rabbits, and non-human primates. In parallel, we have worked on uh, the manufacturability of the virus and the upscaling of the uh, CTM manufacturing process, and also in parallel, uh, the manufacturing of 
already uh, uh, what what will become a stockpile of, of uh, virus viral vaccine doses uh, that that can be used later, and uh, we will do our phase one studies in Belgium and uh, in US. So on the next slide, the uh, uh, timeline uh, of of our uh, active for our activities. So as said, uh, we will start our first in human studies. Uh, still this month, uh, both in uh, 18 to 55 year olds. And as soon as we have uh, first data, we will uh, start uh, uh, a cohort of individuals that are older than 65 years. Um, we will do our interim analysis after one dose and uh, then uh, uh, hopefully get permission to start our phase three, first with a, a safety ramp up uh, cohort and then a full enrollment of the uh, uh, of the remaining uh, uh, participants. And this is uh, indeed, as uh, Larry Corey already uh, explained, uh, that will be done as part of the uh, Operation Warp Speed uh, program. Um, and we uh, hope that uh, we can do our study in a region where there is still um, uh, sufficient incidence to demonstrate an efficacy signal. Uh, to get uh, soon to, to that signal and, and then apply for emergency use uh, authorization. And I have already emphasized that in parallel, we are uh, working hard on uh, getting the uh, vaccine doses uh, uh, available. Next slide. So this is uh, the, the, to cite our uh, chief uh, scientific officer, Paul Stoffels, who already early on uh, made the commitment that we will rapidly produce and supply a safe and effective vaccine globally with the aim to manufacture 1 billion doses by the end of 2021. And we are still uh, uh, committed to, to make this happen. Uh, and I, I'm very happy that we are not the only ones and that there's a lot of uh, activity uh, uh, done in parallel. And on the next slide, I would like to acknowledge uh, all external partners and, and Jensen teams who went beyond what was considered possible, working under extremely challenging conditions to deliver the highest quality SARS-CoV-2 vaccine candidate to hopefully help solve the ongoing public health emergency caused by SARS-CoV-2. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Hanneke, for a very nice presentation. Uh, I think we have time for just one or two questions. So one that's coming through is um, that data from several of the COVID-19 vaccine uh, platforms that's been tested in the non-human primates, uh, including the data from um, your publication with Dan Baruch, is indicating that protection from viral replication in the upper respiratory tract is more difficult or more challenging than in the, in the long airways. And the questions coming through about mucosal immunity, given that adenoviruses or the vector that you're using, the, the adenoviruses are normally transmitted by the respiratory route. So what is your thinking on um, intranasal delivery of the AD26 platform? Yeah, so then your is, experience? Sorry, that is something that uh, um, that is on, on our list of uh, doing it sometimes, but we what we do know uh, from our other programs uh, is that uh, we do get sufficient uh, antibody also in the, secreted in the respiratory uh, tract, uh, and that uh, that contributes to uh, to protection. So uh, we we are uh, wrapping up uh, um, uh, additional preclinical data with our lead candidate, and and there we do have uh, very promising results also with respect to protection in upper respiratory tract. And then final question that's come through is that you've tested several different spike imaging designs um, and you've showed the data from the, D, uh, from the DNA vector in the non-human primates and you showed that that the full length S and also the um, membrane bound design were the um, most were the optimal design from what you looked at was that a surprise and it, do you see similar data when it, uh, or similar results when those designs are expressed from the ad vector as compared to the DNA vaccine because often you know, things are different. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so we do have uh, preliminary data that the, what we see as DNA that, that it is confirmed uh, when when delivered in at twenty six uh, context. 
And uh, it is funny that that the question comes if we were surprised because we we were sort of convinced that membrane bound uh, would be best, but uh, uh, we were working in, in in collaboration, so we had a large panel of designs, and uh, and and it was nice to see that based on theoretical uh, um, uh, assumptions that what that we have, why uh, based on which we assume that the membrane bound would be more immunogenic because I think it is a little bit more stable and also potentially longer exposed to the immune system. So it was nice to get that confirmation that indeed the membrane bound did better than the soluble. Great. Well, thank you very much. You and we wish you much success um, and we look forward to hearing the um, ad data when it comes soon. Thank you so much. Thank so you. I think in the context of time, we need to move on to our next speaker now. And it's a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Kenneth Swanson, who is a director in viral vaccines at Pfizer Vaccine Research and Development. She currently leads a team focused on research and development of novel vaccine candidates going from uh, preclinical all the way to phase three development. So a little bit of background on Kenna. She trained as an immunologist at the Indiana School of Medicine, and that was followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in bacterial pathogenesis at the Rocky Mountain Laboratories at the NID in Montana. But over the last 10 years, she's been working at Pfizer, where her group has supported preclinical and clinical research on bacterial and viral candidate vaccines and has also assessed the poten uh, potential um, immune correlates of protection of some of those vaccines. So Kenner is currently the research scientific lead for Pfizer's RSV and COVID-19 vaccine programs based at Pearl River in New York. And today she's going to give us an update on the COVID-19 RNA vaccine under development by Pfizer and also BioNTech. So Thank you, and over to you, Dr. Swanson.